great British explorer, George Mallory, was to die on Mount Everest, was asked why did he want to climb it. He said because it is there. I'd like to begin my presentation by conveying an overarching sense of scale. The universe that we live in is really, really big. Beginning with what we are all familiar with, international travel here on Earth still takes 10 to 20 hours to get to the farthest places. Embarking on a journey to Mars using the best chemical propulsion technology we have still takes a whopping eight months. This is a technology we're all familiar with, gigantic rockets carrying millions of pounds of fuel with which they propel themselves upon a controlled explosion out of the Earth's gravitational influence. Despite its amazing capabilities here within the solar system, for journeys beyond the outermost planets, chemical propulsion is just hopelessly slow. To illustrate this, a trip from the sun to the nearest star, Alpha Centauri, which is actually a triple star system, would take 75,000 years with the best chemical propulsion technology available to us today. From this, it can clearly be seen that if exploration beyond the outer limits of the solar system is to be conducted within reasonable fractions of a human lifetime, a radical shift in propulsion technology is necessary. I'm gonna take you all on a journey to Alpha Centauri, not with rockets, but with lasers. Imagine you wanna send a spacecraft to Alpha Centauri in a mere 20 years instead of 75,000 years. How would you do it? Well, first of all, we need the spacecraft to travel really fast. So fast, in fact, that we need to achieve what we call relativistic velocities, or speeds that are significant fractions of the speed of light. This is, of course, entirely impractical with the rockets of today, so I'd like to describe to you an innovative system for achieving these speeds. Imagine an extremely bright laser located on the surface of the Earth. A laser so bright and intense that it is the brightest and most intense laser ever built by humanity. Now imagine an extremely light spacecraft, a spacecraft so light and small that it is the lightest and smallest spacecraft ever built by humanity. To describe how these two work together to achieve relativistic velocities, it helps to begin with a little physics. Imagine, if you will yet again, imagine another outlandish thing, a brick wall floating out in space. With no friction to stop it from moving, if I were to push on the wall, it would travel away from me at the constant speed it was traveling at when my hand left its surface. Now imagine chucking a basketball at the wall such that it bounces off. You can envision that the wall would experience a force and thus similarly move away from you at a constant speed. Now imagine chucking a constant stream of millions and millions of basketballs at the wall, such that it is constantly being struck by them and thus constantly picking up speed. If you did it for long enough, and without worrying about how tired you got, the brick wall would eventually be moving at relativistic velocities. And finally, to complete the analogy, replace the brick wall with an ultralight spacecraft cleverly engineered to reflect light, and replace the basketballs with individual photons of light that comprise a laser beam. So, now we're equipped with the basic concept of a laser-propelled interstellar spacecraft, the lightest and smallest spacecraft ever built, pushed through space by the brightest and most intense laser ever built. You may have noticed that this is kind of like balancing a pencil on your fingertip. If the pencil begins to lean in any direction, you have to quickly correct for it by moving your finger or else the pencil will fall. In the spacecraft's case, the same is true. If the spacecraft moves out of the very middle of the beam, it could be flung out of it altogether. So, how do you correct for this? Well, one option would be to develop a system that allows the laser to be constantly aware of where the spacecraft is so it can correct for deviations in real time. However, this is trickier than it sounds, largely due to the astronomical accelerations that the spacecraft experiences. In the end, what we found is that the best solution to this problem is to ensure what we call passive stability. In other words, the spacecraft needs to stay centered in the laser beam all by itself and without any active control. To achieve this, we do something to the laser beam that is akin to holding onto that pencil with a tight grip, rather than letting it balance on your fingertip. In technical jargon, we alter the intensity profile of the beam to produce a well at its center. Kind of looks like the profile of a cowboy hat, where the spacecraft sits in the slight dip in the center. This, in combination with a clever sail geometry, allows the spacecraft to be pushed back into the middle of the beam by the slightly more intense beam that it is surrounded by. Once the spacecraft has been accelerated to its final velocity of a quarter the speed of light, it enters the cruise phase, during which it travels for 20 years through the interstellar space between the Sun and Alpha Centauri in a low-power hibernation mode. Now, given both our previous analogy of the brick wall floating frictionlessly through space 
and the rather hopelessly incorrect depiction of interstellar travel in popular culture. Think warp drives in Star Wars and Star Trek. This might seem like a pretty mild ride. But in reality, the space between the Sun and Alpha Centauri isn't entirely empty. The interstellar medium, is, as it's called, is actually filled with an extremely diffuse gas of hydrogen. Um, analysis and simulation has shown that barreling through the interstellar medium at a quarter of the speed of light is actually extremely dangerous, even for an ultralight spacecraft, since each minute impact of a hydrogen atom on the leading edge of the spacecraft eventually results in damage that becomes detrimental over the 20-year journey. It's kind of like trying to run as fast as possible from point A to point B through an endless stream of speeding bullets. Not very easy. Therefore, the spacecraft is being equipped with a specialized shield that allows it to trap these incoming hydrogen bullets and either store them or release them over time. Now, let's assume that the acceleration phase goes perfectly and that the spacecraft survives the cruise phase unscathed. This is a rather hefty assumption, given our, given our previous description of the dangers of interstellar travel, hence why we have proposed sending hundreds of spacecraft at a time to statistically ensure that at least one will make it. So for now, let's assume that one has made it. What happens once it's there? Well, unfortunately, there's no known practical way to slow the spacecraft down once it arrives, so it will coast through the Alpha Centauri system at the same speed it was accelerated to. It's kind of like trying to collect as much visual information about a painting hanging on a wall while running as fast as possible right by it. <laughs> at a quarter the speed of light, the spacecraft will spend only one hour in the Alpha Centauri system. When it arrives, it wakes to the view of three stars in an endless orbital dance. Two large sun-like stars and one small red dwarf star orbited by a recently discovered and potentially Earth-like planet. Now we're ready for my favorite part, science time. <laughs> The suite of sensors on the spacecraft awakens, and the spacecraft orients itself to view the three stars. Then, the first sets of data and photographs ever taken at another star system are collected. Once the onboard computer decides which data is suitable for transmit, the spacecraft orients itself such that its onboard laser can beam the information back to Earth, encoded in pulses of light that take four years to travel back to Earth. We can see from all this, with some very clever engineering, humanity's first ever interstellar mission is actually within our reach. And although the universe is indeed really, really big, we can be proportionally as clever. In the end, once all the necessary infrastructure has been constructed, the spacecraft has been built and launched, and the data has made its trip back to Earth, I will likely be a white, bearded old man. But it will be amazing to see the day that photographs from the sun's nearest stellar neighbor return to Earth from four light years away encoded impulses of laser light. Thank you. <laughs>